right, welcome to the class tonight. We are, um, I think, in class number seven of uh, Knowing the Truth. Last In the last class, we were dealing with the encounter with Jesus of two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And I want to continue that thought and uh, look at look at a point that that uh, I think is very necessary to make and I want us to um, consider it together during this class it's it's we, we talked about the the setup here before before this happens is Jesus has risen from the dead and there are the women who go to his tomb to uh, anoint him and they encounter uh, basically they encounter an angel that says he's not here he has risen and they go back and tell the disciples or the the disciples and, and tell them what the angel or the messenger told them and 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 uh, and it says that to the disciples and those who heard their their sayings it was uh, idle idle words and vain words and this is not because they thought the women were untruthful or that they were uh, Known liars. I mean, that's not what this is about. This corresponds again with past lessons on a capacity that is missing and a necessity that 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 lies upon us who have come to who have come to the reality of the risen Christ, and that is that words are insufficient. Doctrines, teachings, concepts, principles are insufficient. They are, at their best, empty. Because the words must come to be substantiated in the face and in the presence of someone. You can't just believe these things. It's like the Queen of Sheba. When she encounters Solomon and all the effects that it has upon her, she says it was true. They said true words. Their report was accurate and true concerning you. But the first thing is, I could not, and that's how it's said in the complete Jewish Bible, I could not believe their words until I came and mine eyes have seen you. Because those words needed an evidence to confirm them, and that evidence comes in the seeing of him. The truth of those true words comes in the presence of him. Because she did not have the capacity to know the truth of those words, because she had no true point of reference with regard to those words. All she had around her was that which with, with which she was familiar. And none of those familiar things could define what his presence defined. What his person defined. And that's what we're talking about. So when they come to the to disciples and, and tell them, I mean, these are people that experience this. These are people who have experienced the messenger saying he's not here. They've seen an empty tomb. They've They've had an experience where they understand and know what they're talking about, but they could not convey that to these people because there's one thing, and th th there's a difference between hearing and, and believing that he is risen and encountering the one who is risen. There's a difference. And a risen Christ necessitates such an encounter. Our salvation necessitates a face-to-face, -face, the eyes of our soul being opened and enlightened, flooded with his own light, that we may know. And this is what we're going to talk about, the means necessary to know him or to know the truth as we're talking about in these classes. 
So then we went went on to when they were speaking the uh, I'll go ahead and read the verses, but they were the two of the disciples and, and the way it's connected here you you will see that it's two of the ones who heard the sayings of these women, and they say that later to Jesus, but Behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three three score furlongs. And they talked together of all the things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. Now, we were, I think we ended the last time together focusing on that. The fact that they were talking and conversing concerning Jesus, concerning the things that had happened to him, his death, and now this reported resurrection that they have heard about, And they're communing and having discussions and all of that. And I just thought about the, the way that we do. <laughs> and our conversing about him and our talking about him. And, and here's the point. There is a basis that, that governs most of our conversation. And we're going to talk about it. It's, the same, it's really the same premise and basis that governs these men's conversation at this point in time and Jesus yet in the midst of their ignorance with regard to this this miraculous reality of the living risen son of God in their midst he is yet in their midst their ignorance did not negate the fact that he was present And we need to understand that. Ignorance is not the same as deficiency. Ignorance is is a not knowing of the fullness that is present. But that does not negate the fact of a present fullness. This is what I want us to understand because I talk to people a lot on the phone, uh, different ways, emails and whatever. Here lately especially it's, it's picked up where people that I've never really even heard of from, or heard from, uh, will, will contact me and, and we'll talk and some of us, sometimes we talk for a long period of time. But it seems like there is this underlying thing that that governs and dictates the conversation and it has to do with an under, a misunderstanding with regard to the ground of our pursuit i recall years ago the lord really impressed on me the fact that he that Paul, when he talks about seeking that which is above and uh, looking for the appearing of the Lord, our life, Christ, our life, he does not do it as those who have still a great deal to accomplish or to apprehend as far as getting to a certain place. He speaks to them as already risen with Christ, as a state of being. Since you are risen, set your affection. The ground of our pursuit is not a ground of deficiency. We stand upon a certain, sure, absolute ground of fullness and perfection. A fullness and perfection that resides in our soul whether we understand it, know it, or not. I want us to get that. I want us to see that it's not, I mean, even with Paul talking to believers who are being duped into going back under law or going under law to find a righteousness, he does not negate their salvation. He is questioning whether they are knowing their salvation or not. He is showing them, he, he, is, he is 
dealing with them as those who have come to perfection, who are indwelt with all fullness, but are yet deficient in understanding, yet ignorant of the fullness that has been given, of the grace of God that has been bestowed. And in such ignorance are looking to, uh, to, to, to achieve or attain something that God's already provided as his son present in the soul. So we have to see that even in the midst of our ignorance, Jesus is in the midst. He is in the midst of these men who are walking, conversing about Jesus. And that's what most of us do in our ignorance. We love to commune and talk about Jesus. Our conversations about Jesus. And most of it is a pitiful thing. Because they're conversing about him and yet missing the very fact of his presence. Because their eyes are yet not open that they may know him. They are not beholding him as he truly is. And we've talked about that in the last class and and why I believe that is. Uh, done by the Lord and I'm not going to get back into that but but here's, here's where we stopped in the last class in the midst of our ignorance he is present he is present in the midst of our ignorance I know in the church world it, there's there's songs and there's messages about we need to get more of Jesus. No, you don't. You don't need to get more of Jesus. You need to come to know. You need to see, experience the Jesus that is present. Because by the grace of God, of his fullness have we all received. It's not a matter of fullness being present or not. It's a matter of my understanding with regard to the fullness that is present. Or I could say it better this way. It's a matter of how much of the Father's understanding with regard to that present fullness is being revealed and worked and brought into my soul. Because it's never my understanding of Him that that is developed, it is the Father's view and perspective and knowledge of His Son that is revealed. So I want us to see that. and, then, and the, Because here in this story, I hate to call it a story, but here in this situation that we're reading about, we're dealing now with a risen Christ. One who is raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. And in so all that is surrounds the resurrection, all that is all the fullness and the glory that followed, as Peter said, all the that which God wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. This is what we're dealing with now. We're dealing with a, a risen son. And he is present. And as I said, the conversation and the reasoning of these men had basically the same basis as the majority of the communing and the reasonings and the conversations of Christians today. And Jesus uh, says unto them here in verse 17, What manner of communications are these you have one to another? As you walk and are sad. Sadness. See we're not talking about emotional sadness. We're not talking about boo-hoo and crying. We're talking about a sadness. Because something they desired. Something they hoped for. Something they expected. Something they trusted. Seems to be. 
unfulfilled. Seems to be missing. They are disappointed because they are ignorant of a reality that is yet present in their midst. So they are sad, inwardly sad and distraught and disappointed. And that's the basis of their communication. And I'm telling you, that's the sadness that governs the majority of Christianity today. That's the disappointment that governs most communications you even get from a pulpit. It's the sadness of a soul that is yet unfulfilled. A soul that is not understanding a present completion. As if God is withholding something. Come on, this is, all, this is what it is. Uh, uh, this is what knowing the truth is all about. It's about seeing reality. It's the, it's the Father expounding in an inward way all spiritual fullness in the presence and person of His Son. And that son can be present in the midst and present in the soul and we still be governed by this sense of unfulfillment, disappointment, dissatisfaction. And so we have to come up with why that dissatisfaction is there. We have to suck it up until a future time where that will finally be taken care of by God or whatever. Or we... You know, we, we've come up with so many different ways to deal with the disappointment or the uh, sadness of unfulfilled or a heart that's sick because of a deferred hope or deferred expectation. Remember the, the verse, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Well, most Christians are living in that sickness and in in a heart being sick and sad because of a seeming deferment of an expectation God himself gave. But the expectation God himself has fulfilled. Remember, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Not Christ in you, a hope for glory, but hope, the hope. Christ in you, the hope, the expectation, the object of hope, the object expected. But there's a sadness in their communications, and he knew that. He understood that. And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Are you only a stranger in Jerusalem? Hast not known the things which are come to pass these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed, in word before God and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But see, that wasn't, that wasn't really the true problem. That wasn't the real basis of their sadness. Here's the basis of their sadness in verse 21. We trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. Beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. We're not just dealing with emotions here. We're dealing with people who had an, ex an expectation given of God. We trusted it would be Him. We trusted, we trusted it would be Him. Now here's the point. This is not just a condition of hope. They had locked upon him as the object hoped for. Yes, they had locked upon him as the object hoped for. But now he's no longer present as he once was. They can no longer know him as they once 
knew him. And because of this, they believe their hope is yet unfulfilled. And their hope has been disappointed and destroyed. And yet, he is right there. We're talking about an eschatological expectation these men had, believing in the death of him, even all that he said about the death, burial, and resurrection, believing that in him being killed by these chief priests offered on the cross, now their hope, their expectation, the one given of God that they had latched upon him as the substance of, is gone, unfulfilled, destroyed. They had hoped redemption would come. Now redemption is still not present. A kingdom would be established. Now a kingdom is yet to come. Still hasn't come. A salvation still yet to be wrought of God. A fullness still ungiven of God. Promised. But the hope or the one that they latched upon and said here is the object of our hope. Is no longer present as they once knew him is no longer visible to the natural eye as he once was. So now their hope is gone. And their trust is dashed. Their expectation seems to be unfulfilled. What is important about this word hope or trusted is that it's not referring to an abstract condition or feeling of hope. It is the object hope for. This is the same word used in Jesus' assertion that Moses accused the Jews that although careful in the investigation and application of scriptures have refused him as the object of the writings of Moses. They believed the writings of Moses and their careful adherence to him was the objective. But Christ and Christ alone was the object of the volume of the book. He was the object of which Moses wrote. Remember, you trusted in Moses. There was an object in his writings. And you have made that object you. You have made yourself that object. Well, it's the same thing here. It's the object hoped for. Let me let me read something. Uh, this is, is the word elpizo or elpizo. It means to expect. But it is, goes on to mean the object of hope, the object of expectation, that which is the basis or reason for hoping. Remember what we talked about the truth? The truth is that basis, that underlying basis out from which God did everything he did, said everything he said. Now he has come. It's the object of hope. See, religion, Christianity, leaves the heart deficient. Not of a feeling of hope. They, they pursue that. But of the object hoped for. Christianity will keep you... Keep you tagging along like a carrot out in front of you. And they will keep you with this, this, this feeling of expectation. So they push it off and push it off. But what they're missing, what, what Christianity is missing in the majority of Christianity, what most hearts are deficient of is the knowledge of the object of hope in his presence. What weight I for my what weight I for my hope is in thee. That's an expectation missing in most. Because we think the expectation and waiting is all intertwined. And it's not. Not waiting on something to come, but it is waiting on the revealing of someone who is present. Yes, that is true. Because the object of the expectation is not afar off. He is nigh, even in you. And yet, these men in their conversation, seeing the things that had happened, yet ignorant of the miracle of resurrection, ignorant of his presence. 
And Jesus is there. And here, that's the beautiful thing. I, I, keep, I keep saying that, but that's the beautiful thing in the midst of all that. He's still there. I mean, he hears their ignorance. He sees their sadness. And he doesn't leave them and say, these guys aren't worth it. These guys aren't worth what I'm about to do or show them or showing them anything more. They're, they're not worth it because they're just ignorant. No, ignorance really is the, is the condition necessary <laughs> for another understanding to come. And he's there to bring his own view, his own perspective. He's there to reveal the spirit of truth has been given to your soul to do one thing, and that is to reveal the truth himself. So it's not a matter of fullness, it's a matter of ignorance. The fullness is there. The prayer should not be, God, give me more, give me more. The prayer should be, let me see the one you have given. Let me see the one who is present. All right, so let's go on. Here's the next verses, Luke 24, verse 22. And certain women, this is, uh, you know, they said we are, we are sad and we had trust, trusted that it had been him who should have redeemed Israel. Remember in this very letter at the beginning of it, I think we pointed it out that when, when uh, uh, Simeon sees this one, he speaks of him as the salvation of God. When Anna comes in uh, and sees him at that very same time, she goes out into the streets of Is in Jerusalem and declares him to those who what? Looked for redemption. You see, they saw reality. They saw something beyond the eight-day-old child that was in that temple. They saw something by faith. They saw something beyond what the natural faculty the faculties could see. And these men, their eyes were still veiled. That they would not see. That they could not, should not see. Because we're dealing with a risen Christ. There is a need, a necessity of knowing him. But there is a means by which that knowing is brought about. There is a means by which the, the, the expectation given of God is known to be fulfilled. And it's not with natural eyes. It's not with natural faculties. You can't know it that way. And God was protecting these men from trying to know a risen Christ in the same way they knew Jesus of Nazareth. So that they would not define a new reality, a spiritual reality, with something they were already familiar with. Can't be known that way. And see, that's, the, that's a big part of the, the sadness and disappointment of religion. Because we still look for evidence in the outward of what is only made known inwardly. What can only be observed Inwardly by the Spirit. What can only be evidenced in the appearing of the Lord in you. And we're going to look at that. So he says, certain women of our company made us astonished. So they were astonished at the words. But astonishment doesn't mean knowledge. Any more than zeal, as Paul says, meant knowledge. They made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came, saying that he had also, that they had seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. Certain of them, which were with us, went to the sepulcher and found it even so, as the women had said. But him they saw not. There it is. Why? Because that's the need. How could they possibly be sad and disappointed 
when there's an empty tomb. When they've heard these people say, an angel told us he was alive. And others went and verified the very fact that he had risen and there was no body in the tomb. How could they still be disappointed? I'll tell you how. Him they saw not. You see, the words of men, even the words that are true, can excite you and pacify you for a moment. But only for a moment. The need. The thing that anchors you in an unseen reality where you no longer look for evidence in the outward. You no longer try to find the, 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 the body of proof for, for a fulfilled eschatology or a fulfilled expectation. You're no longer looking where you once looked for it. The only thing that brings that condition about is seeing Him. Not hearing about it. Not hearing He's risen. Not hearing there's an empty tomb. Not going across the ocean to see an empty tomb. And buy a t-shirt that says He's risen. It's an encounter with the One who is risen. That's different. Not just knowing He's everything. Not just saying, oh, he's the fullness of everything. He is the beginning and end, the Alpha and Omega. I believe it with all my heart. No, it's about experiencing inwardly a face-to-face encounter with the Alpha and Omega. That's the only answer. That's the need. That's how these men could still say, we don't know. We're still disappointed. We believe it would be him. And they say he's risen. We haven't seen him though. We still don't understand what's taking place. We still are ignorant of this miracle that has taken place. We're still ignorant of a new creation that has been brought about. We're still ignorant of salvation in its utmost and fullest fullest degree that has been wrought in the risen sun. We're still ignorant of it. We have no idea. Yet he's there. Now let's look at the next thing. What does he say to them? Then he said unto them, fools, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Slow of heart to believe. Did these disciples actually not think that the prophetic words were untrustworthy? Did they actually think that they could not trust their prophets? So they no longer believed them. Is that what he's talking about? No, that's not what he means. Did he actually think that the prophets had lied? They actually think the prophets had lied to them? First, the word means dull. Dull of perception. Dull of understanding. Dull of seeing. And it brings us back to this previous verse that we looked at earlier Ever learning, but never able. Why? A dullness that is resident in the heart of man. A dullness, an ignorance, a darkness, a a, a void that is there that cannot be remedied by theology or teachings or books. There's an incapacity of believing. Remember what she says. I could not believe. Remember what Paul says. They cannot know the things of the spirit. For they are spiritually discerned. So we try to really develop our spiritual antennas or whatever. I've heard it called different things. We try to really get ourselves spiritually tuned in to the things of God. And we try and we try and try. But still, they are beyond our grasp. We cannot know them. They are unknowable to us. But we have been given the Spirit. That we may know the things that have been freely given. 
Freely given, present, freely given in all its vastness, all its beauty, all its fullness. But that fullness demands the power of another. That fullness demands the knowledge of another being revealed and worked in our soul that is incapable of such an apprehension. That has no capacity when faced with this reality. This is what he's talking about. You could not even understand that the prophets were fulfilled until this risen son is revealed. You'll still be waiting on it. Church world today is still waiting on the prophets to be fulfilled. And Peter in seeing on the mountain and now having seen him inwardly, but he refers back to the mountain of transfiguration and says, he is the more sure word of prophets. He is the prophets in their certainty and absoluteness. He's the amen of all their works. That has to be revealed in the face of this man. That has to be seen in him and not in anything that can't be. It's incapable of being known in any other way. So it means a dullness of perception. That is your constant state. Which leaves us at a constant need and dependence upon the Spirit. To make us to know what we cannot know otherwise. To bring into us His understanding. An incapacity in man. And we've already talked about that with the Queen of Sheba. But let's look at this. Let's go on. Uh, slow of heart to believe. And this is the same thing. Believe. The same thing. I could not believe. This is the same believing. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things to enter into his glory? You see, those words mean nothing until you see him. Oh, the cross is the finished work. The cross is it. Yeah. But do you know the reckoning of the finished work, the reckoning of all that was accomplished in the cross has to take place when my soul beholds the living one? You can't understand the fullness of his death. And all that took place until you see the only one that lives. And then the reckoning comes. Then the reckoning begins. The reckoning, the judgment, the sanctifying effect of the seeing of truth comes then. Otherwise, you're putting the cart before the horse. And you're still trying to attain and attain and get to a point where you can finally see reality. No, seeing reality is the first step. Of this journey of discovering the fullness of Christ that is present. But we're talking here about the means of knowing the truth. The means, the, the true means of it. How is it, how is it that we come to know reality? How is it that our soul comes to experience the fullness that is present? The Christ, the risen one who is in the midst. The truth himself. Because they had true words from the prophets, but they could not know that the words of the prophets were fulfilled until, there, until something takes place. And it's about to take place here, but I want to show you something that falls short, and this may make some of you angry, but it's demonstrating something very important. Because look at verse 27. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, this is everything. This is the whole of the scripture. Beginning at Moses and then all of the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. The word expounded here is very important. Now we're talking about Expounded 
we're talking about a Bible study here, walking down the road that most Christians today would have plucked out their right eyeball to get in. Just to hear Jesus teach the scripture and declare himself out of every part beginning at Moses throughout the whole of the scripture and begins to expound and declare who he is. You see that? Man, that is quite a Bible study. A lot better than any of us could do, I guarantee you. The word expounded here is important because it means to fully explain um, To fully explain with the with the implication leaving nothing out. Everything expounded. That's quite a word. Quite a word. I mean, can you imagine having this great fortune, opportunity, pleasure to hear Jesus himself exegete the scripture. God's own word. But what I want to convey to you is that there was something more necessary. Something more effectual. That was necessary. Then even Jesus himself expounding the scripture while walking with them. Because you'll read in this encounter that during this time, however long it took, however long this explanation took, it took, I guess, the whole journey. The length of it didn't matter. The depth of his words didn't matter because you'll realize when you read this account that nothing had changed as far as these men's understanding with regard to who he was. They had no idea, yet he had expounded, fully explained to them all the scripture concerning himself from an outside perspective talking to them about the scripture and about himself. For all of this time and all the depths that Jesus himself could go to and yet their condition of ignorance had not been remedied. They still did not know him. They may have known that Jesus was the fulfillment of the Mosaic Covenant. They may have known that he was the end of all the prophets. That he was the end of the law. That he was all of that. They may have known that, but they knew it in a way. They knew it in a human knowledge. They knew it by hearing words. A true word. Even from Jesus himself. But yet, there was an inward realization that those outward words uttered even by the lips of Jesus could not bring about. Something more. Something more is necessary. I mean, so much so that when they look back after the encounter that we're going to talk about happens, they look back and say, did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us along the way? You see, there was an effect taking place because they heard words being spoken about Jesus, even from Jesus himself. There was something happening. There was a burning of the heart, a real zeal that took place, all of that. I remember hearing the gospel. I remember hearing the true gospel preached. 
And there was an effect, there was something in me that said, that's it, There's, that's, that's got to be it. That's got to be it. That is so true. And I could have lived the rest of my life convinced that those words were true, went to every conference to hear more words that were true, read books written by the ones that I heard about or heard it from and, and, and was convinced that what they said was true. And I could tell other people those true words. My heart could still burn when I hear those words. But guess what? God wants to bring you beyond just a burning heart. He wants to bring you beyond just believing words and being certain that those words are true. I've told this before, but I remember going from one meeting I heard... This gospel, and, and I went from one meeting, I went home and I laid in the bed, and my body was vibrating. I was so excited of hearing this, and there was something taking place in my heart, and my body was just shaking. And that's not a lie, that's not, I mean, that's true, that really happened. And guess what I could have done, said, man, I want my body to shake all the time. God, please, let this happen to me every time I hear you. This is wonderful. I want to stay right here and shake for the rest of my life knowing this is true. That's See, while that is an appealing thing to some, and while that is something that a lot of Christians will settle for, that's not knowing the truth. Something more is necessary. All of that is, is natural effects from hearing natural words. But those natural words have one objective if they're to the true gospel. And that is that your soul would turn to see the truth of those true words. That your soul would encounter the object of that gospel. The object of which those words testify. Because at their best, the words, the preaching of the gospel is nothing more than a testimony. And they have the same thing, to bring you unto the goal. While they, if they're the gospel, they no longer declare to you a goal is yet to be fulfilled. They declare to you the indwelling Christ as the goal reached. Yet they still have an expectation. Paul calls it the hope of the gospel. The hope of the gospel is the seeing of him who is present. The hope of the gospel is an encounter with the one who was hidden from all ages. Who is now in you as the perfect reaching of a perfect end. Are perfect end fully reached of God. While the words are good, they are insufficient. Even the words of Jesus. And as I said, this journey, no matter how wonderful the words and everything they now understood, now they understood the scripture, right? Now we know the Bible. Now we know that he is the summation of the words. Now we know it. And now we don't need the Bible anymore. He's it. Right? All of those things can be the response of those who hear such true words. And understand that he is the culmination of every jot and tittle of this. But that is still not the same. As a soul encountering the person. Because you can still know all of that. And still not know the one who is present. Because now they know from Moses through the prophets. Jesus is their intent and their meaning. He, they know that. From the lips of Jesus they know that. And they still yet do not know. That that Jesus they're hearing about. Is present right in their midst. And they definitely don't know the Jesus who is in their midst. So let's go on. 
<clears throat> now, Luke 24, verse 28 through 34. Or we're going to read verse 28 and stop for a second. But So he, speak, he, he expounds to them all the scripture, Moses through the prophets, concerning himself. This is a vital part of this encounter. This is verse 28. And they drew nigh unto the village, whither they went. And he made as though he would have gone further. Now this is wonderful to me. And I've, I've seen this a lot. I've talked about it a lot. But this still, it, it blows my mind just how merciful God is. And how much he wants us to understand reality and, and experience reality. Jesus has set forth, I would suspect, the most comprehensive exposition of the scriptures that has ever been spoken or heard. I'm sure that's true. But I wrote, I wrote here, it's the most comprehensive exposition of the scripture that has ever been spoken or heard with natural ears because that's what they were hearing with, right and then this seemingly just a filler phrase can be easily overlooked in the process of this this event but Jesus is here setting a stage that he always sets for those who are hearing reading and even sharing a true report. The phrase he made as though he would go further. Shows us, and if you look it up it's true, that he was actually pretending, actually making as though. He was pretending as if he would keep going beyond that point and just leave him. He made as though. That he would go further. Why is he doing this? What is this? It's a setup. Jesus is affording them an opportunity here. And it's the same opportunity being afforded to every soul in whom he dwells. And especially the soul that is hearing the truth. Or the words of truth. The one who is hearing the true word, reading the true testimony. It is God affording an opportunity to a soul, making as if he's going to move on and you say, no, do not leave. I have heard the words as perfectly as they can be spoken. I have read words that are beautiful indeed. I have all of the things that, all of it, you can say... But do not leave me with words. Do not leave me satisfied in the fact and knowing that I understand these scriptures to be a testimony that you fulfill. Do not leave me there. Let me see something more. Take me beyond the words that are true. Take me beyond a teaching that is true. Take me beyond a report that is accurate. Show me you. I want to see you. I don't want to know that you are the, the amen of the scripture. I want to know you who is the amen of the scripture. See that? There's a difference here. There's a transition now that he is about to bring into their hearts. But they have to desire it. They have to apprehend him. And, and look what they do. They constrain him. Jesus is setting a stage. He is giving them an opportunity to constrain him. Not constrain him in order to hear more true words. Not to constrain him so they can accumulate more spirit, scriptural understanding. They rather settle 
to constrain him, to take them beyond those true words, to bring them to the amen, the revealed presence of the person who is the certainty of those certain words, who is the truth of those words of truth. This is Paul experiencing not a law with spiritual intention that he can apply to himself, but the one who is the spiritual intention of the law. Not words that have an intended goal, but him who is the goal and intention of these words. It's about a person being apprehended and constrained so that you may see a reality that your natural eye couldn't see and that your natural ear could not, could not understand, that the heart could not, even though it burned with a passion, could not apprehend. It demands something greater. It demands something more. They constrained him and said, Abide with us as toward evening, and the day is far spent. See, that's a. And he went to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke it, gave it to them. And they took the bread, and they took it, and their eyes were opened. Their eyes were were opened and they knew him. Now they're not just armed with scriptural knowledge. Now they're just not armed with knowing that he is the fulfillment of all scripture. Now they know him who is the fulfillment of all scripture. You understand? Previously, they did. none of that, none of it, none of this expounding changed anything. But this opening of their eyes, a seeing of him opened, brought about a comprehension inwardly that no word spoken could bring about. Now the real interesting part of this was the word open where their eyes were opened. While it's not the same word in the Greek language, it has the exact same meaning. What could only be outwardly explained by the words, even of Jesus, what was fully explained, nothing left out, nothing missing, no deficiencies, no dangling participles or uh, uh, missing links. That was expounded in words spoken by Jesus to these men's natural ears, but now their eyes are open. And this speaks beyond their natural eyes. Their eyes are open. There is an awake, There is an unveiling, an enlightening of their soul that takes place now. Something words could not bring about. And in the opening of their eyes, there was an, a full explanation and a full expounding that brought about a knowing of Him. That these words could not bring about. And that's when I say knowing the truth is not about knowing doctrine, concepts, and principles and trying to apply them because knowing the truth is seeing the one who is the full application and the full manifestation of all spiritual reality. Nothing left to apply. No principles left. He's it. I am. And look what happens. What happens, the word here um, for opened, it means to expound fully. Dia noigo. 1272 in the Strong's. And it also goes on to mean the dividing or drawing asunder 
to open by drawing open or open asunder like a veil being removed. The veil was removed from their heart. Hearing true words when a veil remains on your heart brings about no, no real understanding. But when the veil is removed. See, that's why when the veil was removed in seeing the Son, God revealed His Son in me. Now Paul, who looked at these true words with a veiled heart, can now see these words in the light of reality and declare Him, where, where, declare Christ where He once found Himself, where He once tried to find Himself and tried to put Himself. As a perfect adherent to the law. As the perfect life that God was after. As the holy one that God was looking for. But what happens after this is the, is the key. Here's after they knew him. Their eyes were open and they knew him. And look what happens. He vanished out of their sight. He vanished. He had been with them all this time. Now their eyes are open. They know him. He vanishes. Why? This is the pinnacle of the event. This is it. And this seems strange to some why he would do this, but it's wonderful beyond words. Because he vanished because open eyes The open eyes, the eyes of the heart being unveiled and open and enlightened. Open eyes no longer necessitates external evidence. Truth revealed needs no natural proof. And there still could have been in their hearts this feeling of sadness, disappointment, because their expectation was unfulfilled, even knowing about Jesus. Because, hey, they knew Jesus. They, I mean, they, they had heard all this stuff about Jesus. Jesus himself called himself the door. He called himself all of this. But they still needed some kind of proof. But now the eyes of their heart has been unveiled. The curtains, the, 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 the curtain has been drawn back. The veil upon their heart has been rent from top to bottom, being a work of God and not of man. And in this, the full explanation, the full utterance of God embodied in this man has come and filled their heart And becomes the very knowing of their soul. And in such a knowing they need no proof other than that revealing. And that understanding. There is no proof necessary. Because all the proof has been known. It's called faith. The proof. The evidence of what could not be seen. The substance of what was hoped for. Faith comes. Faith now governs. And they are able to go and declare. He revealed his son that I might preach him. Knowing the truth. Is knowing a reality beyond the realm of sight and sound. Because if I have said before, the truth has no reference point. In the natural realm. Truth has no reference point. In the natural realm. May we never substitute the eloquent teaching may we never substitute true reports and true words true testimony for that wonderful miracle of the opening of the eyes the unveiling of the heart to behold the one who has always been present may the Lord reveal his son And in the seeing of him, we know the truth. 
And in that truth there is a liberty and we'll get to that and we'll talk about it. But may the Lord unveil our hearts and show us reality. Show us the reality words cannot show. All right, we're done. Um, Thanks for being with us uh, tonight. Again, conference is coming up at the end of uh, June. We keep announcing it. If you guys are interested in coming, it's June the 20th through the 24th. And uh, it's right here at the Research Center in Leslie, Arkansas. So there's a website on your screen. You can uh, contact us if you uh, want to come, and we'll we'll, uh, help you in any way that we can, maybe finding a place to stay. Just contact us, and uh, we'll, we'll try to help you out. So with that being said, we'll pick up in our next class. Thanks. Amen.